What is neurodiversity? What is it about these people? Dyslexia. Autism spectrum. ADHD. Gifted. Dysgraphia. All brains are different. It's okay to be who you are. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. Today we are talking about the rewards and punishment system prevalent in society and particularly parenting. Our guest, Alfie Cohn, says rewards are no more helpful at enhancing achievement than they are at fostering good values. In fact, punishments and rewards are ways of manipulating behavior that destroy the potential for real learning. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and we'll talk about the rewards and punishment paradox straight ahead on the Neurodiversity Podcast. We are preparing to launch our very first virtual course, and this one is geared towards educators. Strategies for Supporting Twice Exceptional Children is a six-module course that is offered virtually. It can be used by schools as in-house professional development or by individuals for self-study about supporting twice exceptional learners. If you or your school is interested in learning more about this course, be sure to go to neurodiversity.university to learn more and sign up for updates and information. That's neurodiversity.university. Up next. Hi, this is Alfie Kelm, the author of Unconditional Parenting and other books about children and human behavior. Stay with us. You are listening to the New Diversity Podcast. Alfie Cohn is a writer and thought leader in the areas of parenting, education, motivation, and effort. The most recent of his 14 books is Schooling Beyond Measure and Other Unorthodox Essays About Education, and he is well known for his book Punished by Rewards. He has some ideas that go against many of the traditional beliefs that we were taught about human development and rewards and punishments. We'll talk about how reframing this conversation is not only best for neurodivergent people, but really, it's best for everyone. His website is alfiecone.org. That's A-L-F-I-E-K-O-H-N dot org. Alfie, thank you so much for being here. Sure. I know that probably a lot of our audience has come across your work, but I'm also sure that there are probably a lot of them um, who aren't maybe in the fields of education or mental health who, who might be unfamiliar with it. So just to start off, can you just give us a brief overview of your general philosophy of motivation and education? Um, my work on motivation is uh, informed by hundreds of studies demonstrating that rewards like punishments are ways of doing things to people, whereas the only way to be uh, helpful in the long run is to work with people. And that, in fact, rewards like punishments actually make people less interested in or committed to whatever they had to do to get the reward. Uh, This is true in the workplace, in the family, and in school. My work on education also deals with uh, the benefits of a more progressive approach that takes its cue from the interests and questions that kids have and focuses more on deep understanding of ideas than memorization of, of facts. And in various books and articles, I have challenged the use of grades, tests, lectures, homework, um, and of course, traditional discipline plans. And one other aspect that's especially relevant to parenting is that rewards, including praise, by the way, is harmful not only because it lowers kids' interest in what they had to do to get the reward, but also communicates to them that they are accepted and loved only conditionally, where they have to jump through hoops in order to get our approval, our attention, our acknowledgement, and that what kids need is the opposite of that, not just to be loved, but to be loved for who they are, not just for what they do. So much of what we do in our schools and how we parent is really just based in those very strong behaviorist theories. And It's just so ingrained in our culture, but I know that we have these little pockets that are really trying to break out of it. I'm a clinical mental health professional now, but I was a teacher first. And when I first started teaching, all of the elementary school classrooms had a behavior chart with a color code for all of the students in the classroom. And I went along with it because I hadn't been given any other 
options or ideas. And as the years went by, that was kind of repackaged as PBIS. Yep. I remember one of the first times one of our school psychologists made the suggestion that classrooms don't need these behavioral modification plans. And I was kind of shocked. But even though I, I knew I was one of the kids when I was growing up, <laughs> it didn't work for me. <laughs> and it was really eye-opening. Yeah. Well, I would be. I would say even more strongly, first of all, it's not just that it didn't work for you. It can't work for anyone. Mm. In fact, I would go beyond that and say it's not just that it doesn't work, but that it actively harms kids' moral and social development. The problem with, with these plants, which sadly have not faded away, you know, and there's now there's new cutesy apps mm-hmm. to treat kids as if they were pets. Yes. You know, with names like Class Dojo and <laughs> school-wide programs like PBIS. The problem with them is not only, A, that they don't work particularly over the long run, and B, that these methods are also just grievously disrespectful of children and the way they manipulate them. The problem isn't just with the method, it's with the goals that are driving people to use these techniques. Because the goal is not to help kids become morally sophisticated people who are independent thinkers and compassionate members of a community. The goal is compliance. Mm-hmm. All reward and punishment programs, even if we use euphemisms like positive reinforcement or logical consequences, the goal is not to promote kids' growth. The goal is to get them to do what they're told without question. And that's why simply tweaking the methods, the techniques, the programs won't suffice until we question the goals that we as educators and parents have and move past the sort of simple-minded desire to get kids to just jump through our hoops. I'm curious. I have three kids. My youngest right now is in first grade, and my kids are are neurodivergent and obviously sometimes have some behaviors that don't always (laughs) align with what the teacher would prefer for them to do. How can parents advocate for some other way to support their child in a system that's it's so baked into it? Well, there are some teachers individually who have their concerns about this. Um, and so we shouldn't assume going in that the teacher is gung-ho in favor of these programs. Yeah. That may be true for some principals as well. When I work with parents or educators, I often begin and I do this in a more formalized setting in a workshop, but this can be done in a casual conversation with an individual, is to ask, what are your long-term goals for these kids? Mm -hmm. Or in the case of parents, for your own kids. Mm -hmm. And I I get the same kinds of answers wherever I go. And the focus here is on the long term, after the kids have gone away. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, I want my kids to be happy, to be ethical, to be caring people, also independent and self-reliant, productive, lifelong learners, curious, critical thinkers, stuff like that. And then what I do for a living is I say to people, you say you want this, so why are you doing that, Mm -hmm. given that the that, the traditional practices that we use for raising and teaching kids, can be proven to make it less likely that your kids will turn out the way you yourself say you hope they will. And by by parents doing that sort of respectful challenge with teachers, and vice versa, by the way, um, I think we can understand that it's not just neurodivergent kids. It's not just my kid. Here's the research showing, for example, to take one of many strands here, that children who are frequently rewarded or praised are less generous and caring than other kids. Mm. And then I invite people to try to make sense of that finding, which may be surprising to them or counterintuitive, and help them see that it makes perfect sense. Well, of course, if the goal is to get somebody to say, good job, or to give them a sticker or a star or a cookie, they will now become less focused on making other people happy. Mm -hmm. Or, or meeting other people's needs, you've now made that child more self-centered. And you've taught the child that it's not about ethics. It's about power. Mm-hmm. You're the person with the goodies. You get to make the kid do whatever you want. And as a result, that 
interrupts the process of the child's moral development. So with conversations like this, and by also giving teachers and parents articles to read and books to read and uh, videos to watch and so on, you can help them realize that these traditional practices are not just ineffective, but counterproductive. And then you can maybe point them in the direction of resources that uh, help them get better at a more respectful and constructive way of helping kids. Alternatives to classroom management and, and as I say, treating kids like pets that take a little learning because they're not just about manipulation. They take a little more talent, a little more time, a little more effort, a little more care, and above all, a little more courage, but are far more powerfully effective than uh, bribes and threats. We talk a lot about self-regulation and wanting kids to be able to self-regulate. And it just doesn't make sense when you think about it. If you're giving any sort of a reward, or I think this is the other thing that sometimes people don't realize, it's like the removal of a reward is in itself a punishment. Yes, that's right. And that's where you get into like the positive reinforcement type of statements. And that... those two are just two sides of the same coin. Exactly. If I, if I threaten to punish you, if you don't do what I want, it's obvious I'm controlling you. But it's not as obvious, though it should be, that rewards are just sugar-coated control. I love the way you put that it's all about the power because that is what it's about. But people don't see it that way. Yeah. I remember, you know, my fifth grade teacher, she would say, this is for your um, benefit. And you start out the week with all five of your cards and you can keep your cards. It's all about you. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God, <laughs> it is not for my benefit. It is for you to get silence and obedience. And it is not within my choice in the way you pretend it to be, because you're the one who set up the ridiculous system of control. Mm -hmm. But I think, again, we have to step back and not just look at the method, but at the, at the goal. Mm -hmm. Because even self-regulation as a goal can be problematic if that's really just a way of saying, I want you to be so controlled that I control you with remote control yeah. so that you have swallowed whole my goals for your behavior, and you will do what I want even when I'm not around to reward you or punish you. Because that's what a lot of self-regulation and self-discipline is about. There are degrees and types of self-regulation where some kind of a more integrated and authentic kind of internalization of good ideas where the child still is making decisions and thinking about what's in her best interest. But even with terms like self-regulation, you have to watch out because it may be just about getting kids to do whatever we want. The neurodiversity community in particular really pushes back against a lot of this. I think a lot of that comes from neurodivergent adults who really experience stuff, you know, like applied behavioral analysis or ABA. And they're really um, trying to find other ways to have a different understanding um, do you have any other insights just related to specifically neurodiversity or neurodivergent individuals in some of these methods that have been used? First of all, I, I'm not quite as optimistic as you are. You may be tr running in circles as I do where neurodiverse adults are speaking out against the horror of something like ABA, which is almost uniformly condemned mm -hmm. by autistic adults who went through it themselves. Uh, which is should stop anyone in, in his tracks who's still doing it. Mm -hmm. But to realize that in the broader society we live in, this stuff is nowhere near being challenged. This stuff is actually required by law in, in many states. And mm -hmm. stuff like ABA with autistic children is literally the only kind of intervention that people are even aware of. Right. And they are told that it is evidence-based, or even more outrageously, the only kind of treatment. Mm -hmm. We're setting aside the question of what it means to treat autistic children, which right. typically means making them into someone they're not or else. But that this is the only way we can do things. And... Nobody knows otherwise, and especially because these people who purport to be scientists in, in with a program like uh, ABA, but actually in their cult-like clinging to an approach developed originally on laboratory animals are more like Scientologists, but 
the dissident view that this stuff a in fact is not as i as i show in a in an essay i wrote last year called autism and behaviorism mm -hmm. which is available on my website is not evidence based but in any case is a profoundly disrespectful way to treat a person regardless of being neurocon or divergent and regardless of age but I think that as appalling and widespread as behavior management gimmicks are in our society, even people who wouldn't treat people who are neurotypical have no hesitation about believing it is necessary and justified to treat kids with special needs this way. And so it is absolutely the the coin of the realm in the whole field of special education is to basically train those children as if they are pets without listening to their perspectives, their needs, their challenges, um, and to try to help them lead the best lives they can to meet their own goals. I guess what I'm saying in a kind of rambling, wordy fashion is all that I'm saying in general about doing to and working with, about conditional and unconditional, about the problems with rewards and punishments, applies in the neurodivergent community with special force. As you're talking, I'm thinking about a client that I'm working with currently. And um, this client is a high school age student and is really struggling, I think, with some burnout related to virtual schooling during the pandemic and is now doing online school, but is really struggling to keep up with the work at the pace that they need. And I think parents understand and are not trying to manipulate this child into getting that work done. But it's so hard for like me as a clinician and those parents to try to support this child in this system, though, that is inherently, like you talk about with grades, if they don't get the work done, <laughs> it's hard to figure out a way to escape some of it. It absolutely is. And that, that leads me to also think about what we mean by work, which, by the way, is a metaphor I don't like for children coming to understand ideas. But a few moments ago, I said that a working with approach that dispenses with rewards and punishments mm -hmm. requires not only more care and effort from the adults, but also more courage. And what I mean by that is that it takes courage for a parent or teacher to realize that when a kid doesn't do what we've told them to do, what we want them to do, the problem may not be with the kid, but with what we told them to do. Mm -hmm. It may be the request or demand that is more for our convenience than for the child's benefit, or maybe developmentally inappropriate. And it takes courage. The vast majority of classroom management and discipline programs, like the vast majority of parent discipline books, all begin with the premise that whatever the adult wants the kid to do is legitimate. And we will figure out some tricks and techniques for you to get your way. What I try to do which is not always welcome in my own work, is to begin by asking, question your request here. And that goes not only for the things parents want kids to do on a, on a given evening, but with school, it also goes with the curriculum, or what's often called the work. Mm -hmm. How do we get the kid to do the worksheet if that kid doesn't show the focus we want, the persistence, the attention, doesn't sit down, is making... The problem is that you're using worksheets. Right. <laughs> the problem's not with the kids, right? because worksheets are not about thinking deeply about questions that matter. They're about cramming forgettable facts into short-term memory. So you can't separate these larger questions about the behavioral, social stuff that's going on in, in schools from the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Who set it up? Who benefits from it? How thoughtful is it? Those questions have to be addressed as well, which leads me to you know, books that I've written drawing from the work of many other people about what it means to have classrooms that are inclusive, but are 
also intellectually vibrant and worthwhile places to be. So is it ever too late? How do people come back, <laughs> either from investing <laughs> their lives in buying into and, and implementing this reward-punishment paradigm, but also the flip side of that, like having lived through it? Is there a way that people can kind of even be aware of that and start to kind of break out of their own belief systems that have maybe been taught to them through this? Well, the first step is to reach them with something that's provocative and unsettling that they haven't been invited to think about before. Hence, podcasts like yours, presumably, and mm -hmm. books like mine, I hope, and presentations. And then the next step is the way we invite people to rethink this, to do something with their gulp so that they don't just clap their hands on their ears and say the equivalent of la, 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 which that la, la, la takes the form of things like, oh, that sounds nice in theory, but, you know, with my kid, it would never work, et cetera. Those are ways of people sending off very unsettling challenges, not only to what they've been doing with their kids, but in many cases to what was done to them when they were kids. Right. And it can be terrifying to acknowledge that some of the way we perhaps were raised and taught was not for our own good and was not ideal. And we may be struggling with that. And the last thing we want to do is then turn around and do the same thing to our kids. I think we're all, as parents, familiar with the phenomenon I, I call, how did my mom get in my larynx <laughs> when we catch ourselves saying the same exact thing in the same tone, you know, or assuming that if, if I don't punish my child when she does something bad, I'm letting her walk all over me. I'm letting her get away with it. I'm failing to be firm and so on. Or that if we, if we don't praise kids when they do something we like, when they say help somebody, good job, I like the way you shared your muffin with Diane. You're such, if we don't do that, what's the premise of our doing that? It's that if a kid does something nice, it must have been a fluke, and it would never happen again spontaneously unless we offer the artificial inducement of our approval to make kids do it again, which is not only manipulative, but deeply cynical about children and, by extension, human nature. So the hope is that we can challenge folks so that they will say, wow, I never looked at it that way before. Tell me more and help me move beyond a behavior-based paradigm. I have this little rule of thumb, mm -hmm. uh, which is that the value of a, a resource for parents or teachers is inversely related to the number of times that resource contains the word behavior. Mm. As soon as you frame the topic in terms of behaviors that you can see and measure, the stuff on the surface, you've given up. Now you're obviously going to be resorting to bribes and threats, because those are the ways to reinforce or extinguish behaviors. By that, you're ignoring the needs and values and motives that underlie and inform behavior. In fact, you're ignoring the kid who engages in the behavior. So beware of anything that's behavior focused, as well as stuff that's explicitly about behavior management. So last question as we kind of wrap up, if there are parents out there who are wanting to put some of these things into place, how can they help their kids handle that change? Yeah. Will there be any hiccups there as they kind of readjust to a different type of interaction? Yeah, there may well be. Because if, um, if, if your child is used to being controlled with rewards and punishments, what psychologists call extrinsic inducements, that has probably led to the diminution of intrinsic motivation and a sense of autonomy. So if you take away those extrinsics, it's not like kids are going to leap up and say, hooray, now I can be intrinsically motivated. <laughs> so what, why won't they say that? Well, one reason is because the intrinsic motivation, kids' natural interests and needs may have to be revived, resurrected, you know, um, which may take some time. And a second reason is because now you're doing the abolition of rewards to them. It's better to bring them in on the process, assuming that they're cognitively capable and of an age where they can have a conversation like this, is to start by saying, you know, I heard something interesting on a podcast that said that even though kids want to get some kind of goodie, they don't like being controlled with the goodie they like. Does that make sense to you? 
have I ever done that? How do you feel when I praise you for meeting my standards and then be prepared to listen without getting huffy or defensive? And opening up that channel of communication is one of the most powerful ways you can make a transition. Getting rid of rewards and punishments of any kind and by any name is necessary to do what's right by kids, but it is not sufficient. We also have to think about the good stuff. So in a classroom setting, for example, it's not enough to stop giving grades and homework, though I think you should, or, or get rid of these terrible classroom management and school-wide control programs like PBIS. The question is, well, what do you do? And one of the answers to that is to bring kids in on the process of constructing how we celebrate stuff together, you know, uh, how we solve problems that come up, how we decide on what we're going to study next. I mean, kids learn how to make good decisions by making decisions, mm -hmm. not by following directions. And most of the resources for teachers and parents are just about getting them f to follow directions. But fortunately, there are many resources out there that are more respectful and that work much better. And we have to invite folks to try them out and then come back and talk about them. If you're a parent lucky enough to have a co-parent, then there needs to be a continuous conversation about how we make this family more a working with place than a doing to place and learn more strategies that are really about helping kids to develop in the long run into the kind of people we dream they'll be, as opposed to how in the short run to get them to get into bed or get out of the bath or do whatever else we want them to tonight. Alfie Cohn, we are so grateful for your time today and sharing your thoughts. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Alfie's ideas about rewards and motivation are things that I've seen impact the overall well-being of neurodivergent kids. I think one of the hardest things about implementing this is that it feels just impossible to extract ourselves from the behavioral underpinnings of our schools and society. I mentioned during our conversation that the behavioral systems we put in place for our kids at school don't work for neurodivergent kids, and Alfie pointed out that they don't work for any kids. I think the thing to remember, though, about our neurodivergent kids is that they are more likely to be subjected to these methods in a more persistent and harmful way as our society tries to force that square peg into the round hole. It takes an active voice to advocate moving away from these methods. I think one thing that we really need to do to convince people that they should stop using these techniques is provide a substitute for them. To me, that's about bringing kids into the process, giving them a voice in the decision-making, and examining the traditional hierarchy of power, which so often boils down to, because I said so, which, as you know about our bright kids, they just aren't going to fall for. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. Thanks to Alfie Cohn for his insights. For links to his website and more info, hit the episode 115 page at neurodiversitypodcast.com. Thanks to the musicians who put in the work to crank out the songs you hear on the podcast. If you'd like to help support them and us, please consider becoming a Patreon patron. It's patreon.com slash neurodiversity. Even a couple of dollars a month would be helpful. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. The post production editor and executive producer is me. I'm Dave Morris. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you next time. This is a production of the Neurodiversity Alliance.